Hello, everyone. I'm Christoph Salge from the University of Hertfordshire. And today I would like to talk to you about our continuous information game measure and how to apply it to um, game AI benchmarks. This work is done together with a variety of people. You see them on the screen here. And I'd like to thank all of them for their uh, contributions. So first, I would like to talk a little bit about GVGI specifically, but also other multi-game or multi-problem benchmarks and how we got interested into the overall space of those. Then, looking at them in more detail, we'll get towards our uh, central research question. How do we determine the most discriminatory subset of such a benchmark? I will then introduce the general idea and basic concept of the continuous information gain analysis we performed. And then we'll talk about some results and also some caveats of the method. So first of all, there seems to be a certain popularity of AI challenges nowadays having lots of elements or lots of games or different sub-problems such as GVG AI. With the general idea being that just adding more games will get us more generality and will move us closer towards general AI. But we thought it might be necessary to understand the space these games in better. I mean, at what point do we really have enough games and any additional games will just offer marginal games? Do new games really offer new challenges, even if they're only minor modifications of already existing parts of the benchmark? And also, we can ask ourselves, is the challenge biased in some form? To understand this better, let's first dive in and have a closer analytical look at GVG AI, the general video game AI framework. On the left here, uh, on the right, sorry, uh, you see a few GVG AI games. It's a framework that generally expresses 2D tile-based games, and you have things like Zelda, Frogger, or some Zen-like puzzle game. It was originally developed for game AI research to express a general range of games. And the AIs that are playing it in the GVG AI competition usually do not know what game they're playing. There's nowadays over 100 games to choose from, and agent performance is measured in two values, their win rate and their score. And GVG AI is a bit strange in the regard that if you win the game, the score doesn't really matter. But if all AIs win or always lose the game, and some games can only be won or lost, then the score actually is a deciding factor. And GVG AI has a long history at this point. There's been many, many competitions for planning agents, learning agents, even level and rules generation competitions. So there's a rich, ecosphere of both games and artificial intelligence agents designed for those games to choose from. So what we did was we took the 27 commonly available GVG AI agents, several of them past competition winners, some of them just sample implementations of very basic algorithms such as A star. And we took all 108 GVG AI games from the official corpus. Taking all this data, we can create a chart like this where the win rate is shown for every AI and every game we've tested. And you immediately see that there are some games where the AIs nearly always win, like those very much on the right. And then there are some games where nearly all AIs always lose. And you might think that those are probably less interesting as they offer less of an insight on what's actually going on, as they're just so hard that no AI is actually doing anything there. If we look at the score of all AIs on all games, they sometimes confirm the story and sometimes they tell a different story. So a game like Invest, which is very much on the right here, shows up much more in the middle and has a much more differentiated outcome. But in general, we can conclude just looking at this chart that there's different performance distributions across the set of games, that there are some GVG AI games where nearly all agents win or lose, and then the score decides the outcome. But there are also some games that tell us actually very, very little and that do not really help us to tell the AIs apart at all. 
and that's not what we want. We want games with large score distributions or win distributions because they are better at discriminating. But the other thing we might see is that not all games are necessarily won by the same agent. In the next step, we can look at actual a correlation analysis where we basically check for every pair of games if the AIs that do well in one game also do well in the other. And then we cluster all of these games successively by how close their um, results are correlated. And what we see is that up here, <coughs> we have several clusters of games that are highly correlated. Some of them are a range of puzzle game. The GVGAI corpus actually has many, many modifications of Sokoban, um, having all Sokoban derived names that just slightly change the rule set and most of them are highly correlated. But we also see that there are some games in the middle here where the win rate is anti-correlated to most of the other games. So the AIs that do well on a big part of the corpus do actually worse than the AIs that don't do well on big parts of the corpus. And if we look at score distributions or the correlation between the scores, we see a similar image. Again, <clears throat> there are several clusters of games that are highly correlated and some of them are anti-correlated, particularly with these three clusters in the beginning, which mostly have delayed scoring mechanisms. So we already see here, by looking at this, that there are families of games that seem to have similar outcomes and test similar things from the games. And we can already see that there are certain elements we can identify that um, differ. But the correlation analysis has some shortcomings. So we could, for example, go in and pick a game from each of these clusters to capture the various different aspects on the analysis, but it's still difficult to tell which game in each cluster is actually providing the most information to us. And the other thing we're not considering here is how the performance varies between the different attempts an agent makes. So over the, on average, 1,300 playthroughs, does the agent always score with roughly the same score or are the scores all over the place? So what we looked at here was only the average win weight and the average score. And also, we've only considered win rate and score individually. Could we actually combine these two? But then the question is, how do we really project these two values on a comparative measure. So this brings us to a research question. Can we come up with a process for determining a good subset of all collections of problems that preserves the discriminatory power of the original test set? And can we develop a formal way to test if a new problem adds something new to the existing collection? So ideally, we want an algorithm that we throw on this data that tells us these are the interesting games to look at, or that tells us if I add a new game, this is actually an interesting game to add. So what we've come up with is information gain analysis. So we defined an algorithm and the exact details here are in the paper, but I'm trying to give you a rough idea of how it works without actually bombarding you with the formulas. And if you're interested after this, I encourage you to check it out. So what the formula or algorithm provides us with is a scalar value of how much information each game provides. And I mean that in the Shannon information series sense. So in terms of an average reduction of uncertainty. And then we'll show you how to use that to identify a benchmark or set of games that provides us with the most information about our agents. So what's the general idea? Imagine we would have an AI. And we wouldn't know which of the 27 AIs that I showed you earlier it is. What we could do, or this would basically mean there's an equal distribution and assumption of what AI we're looking at. And then we could actually have that AI play a given game. And that would result maybe in a score. And now looking at that score, we can update our assumption about what AI we're dealing with and maybe our distribution would look something like that. And this is basically all this is. Now these two distributions have an entropy 
and we can compare these two and take the difference. And that, in a nutshell, is the information gain, the average reduction in uncertainty if we observe a certain value. In this case, a score, but it could also be the win rate, or for that matter, it could be any other scalar value that the game provides us with. And we specifically chose continuous information gain because if we look at these two examples up here, if a game were to return a score or if two AIs were to return scores like this versus two AIs that return scores like this and we would just um, create a um, discretization, then both of these games would look similar and maybe have similar discriminatory power. But if we assume that there's actually a distribution of scores happening, then those two uh, scenarios should be different and the one on the left should provide us with more information. Similarly, if we can actually look at all the data, we're also capable of modeling the actual um, variance of the score. So on the left here, we have these Gaussians and we do assume that the scores and everything else is distributed like a Gaussian. We see these rather wide Gaussians and they overlap <coughs> a lot. Well, over here, the average score is actually identical, but with much tighter Gaussian distributions. So the scenario on the right here provides more information to us than the scenario on the left or the game. And finally, we can also use this measure to combine different measurements because everything gets mapped to the language of information. So we can look at score and win rate for the same game and combine them, or we can look at the scores of two different games or the win rates of two different games. And the interesting bit here is that it doesn't just add the information, uh, it actually looks if the new added value or measurement provides additional information, and in general, information is sub-additive. So at best, you get the exact sum. And in most cases, you get less. And again, to visualize this, imagine you have a game um, where you have four different AIs that return measurements like this. And you have another game where you have four different AIs that return a measurement like this. And then you span open the whole space. And if it would look like this, it would provide way less information than if the um, projected um, AIs would lay on the space like this. So here again, um, the separate values for information gain for each of these two games would be identical, but the combined value in one case would be a near complete addition, while in the other case, nearly all the information would be redundant. Applying this measure to the range of TVGI games, we now get quantitative results that support our initial statements. For example, INVEST has 1.6 bits of information gain, which come completely from its score, as we see that the combined information gain is identical to its score information gain. Freeway, on the other hand, has both a high information gain for its win rate and for its score, but the combined information gain from both is less due to the sub-additivity. And over here, this is the most interesting column, where we see the cumulative information gain. So after we look at freeway, we can ask ourselves, what's the second game to add the most information if we look at both of them together? Invest is the second, but then the third one, Labyrinth Duel, is a bit of a surprise as it pushes off a lot of other games that were high on the list because it, compared to the other games, does not provide as much redundant information. And finally, we see that the top 10 games together already provide nearly all the information the logarithm of 27, we could possibly get from them. The information gain analysis has some caveats. It is heavily dependent on the actual population of AIs, and it also might obfuscate certain improvements as it's not a representative subset, it's just the most discriminative. But overall, it captures 
different signals, it's sensitive to noise, and it picks out those games that are best at discriminating between the different AIs. It gives you a nice analysis tool if you're designing a competition or want to have a quick subset to test improvements within the space of the population, and it allows you to evaluate new games you want to add to your challenge. Thank you for your time, and hopefully one of us will be there for your questions.